I was um, about 17 when um, I became aware of, uh, of spirit. Uh, I won't go into all the details, but um, just to say that it was quite interesting the way that it came about that I was sort of uh, drawn into spiritualism. Quite a number of things happened in the right order uh, at the right time to bring me into that awareness. And um, it wasn't very long before I was privileged to sit in a development circle like many people do. I had no aspirations to work as a trans medium. I didn't even know what a trans medium was. Um, I certainly had no, no aspirations to work on the platform. Um, my only interest at that time was healing. Um, as I said to uh, one of your uh, viewers earlier, um, I have a connection with Harry Edwards, and it was that that sort of brought me into uh, to, to, um, being aware of spirit. Um, but I sat in a circle with the, with the hopes of maybe developing as a healer. That was my initial thought. And after about two or three weeks of sitting, it was clear that that wasn't to be the case um, because I, I was very, very soon uh, overshadowed. Um, and uh, that gradually, uh, over a, a period of about 12 months, deepened to the point where I had this um, ever, ever growing, ever building uh, feeling inside me that I wanted to speak. Uh, stand up and speak in the circle. I didn't know what I was going to say. Uh, eventually that came to pass. Um, I uttered a few words um, and I think it was a farmer or someone like that that came through and, and gave a few words. Very simple um, but it sort of set me on the road if you like the pathway to, to developing as a trans medium and it wasn't long after that that White Feather, the guide that works through me, has worked through me for 45 years now uh, started linking with me um, and at the same time I also developed clairvoyance and clairaudience um, and I sat in that development group for about six years we used to meet every week on a Friday evening um, and without fail I very rarely missed a single session I was so uh, dedicated and disciplined um, and the one, the one week, this was about six years on of sitting, the circle leader, who was a trans medium himself, said to me, I'm going to put you on the, on the platform, you know, and I nearly fell through the floor. I thought, no, I'm not ready to do that, you know. But I did, I did it, and I never looked back from there. The trans work itself with White Feather has deepened over the years, and it was some years after he started working through me that I felt the um, the desire and the urge if you like to to be able to take questions or he wanted me to take questions he wanted to answer questions through me um, and that developed quite quickly um, and continues to develop because I don't think there's any such thing as a fully developed medium you're always working to develop more and more um, and one of the uh, hallmarks of White Feather, I think, is his humility, his ability to answer any question that's put to him, and his total and utter respect for everyone, however clever, however intellectual, however humble, however simple they might be. Whatever the question, whatever the person, whatever source it comes from, he will answer it and give it the same degree of attention and love in his answer. Um, now, mediumship, I think, is what it is. It hasn't changed a great deal over the years in itself, in its essence, in the mechanics of it, in that it's a connection with another dimension or dimensions. We call it the afterlife or the spirit world or whatever label you want to put on it. It's the ability to, to connect with that other dimension and have discarnate entities, discarnate people, uh, loved ones, family, friends, teachers, guides work through us and give us messages. And of course, a, a big aspect of that, a large part of that is proving life after death to those who are in need of it, who, who grieve and, and so on and so forth. And that will always remain. But 
the other side of it is the teaching side of it and the philosophy and the, the understanding of the nature of life itself. And that's what I wanted to say a little bit about this evening. Um, just before I come on to that, I want to take you back to 1980. And I had a message from White Feather in trance, which I recorded. And <clears throat> I don't know if you remember those old tape recorders, not the reel to reel ones, but the little cassette recorders. You don't seem to see them now, it's all digital. Well, I recorded it on that. Um, and he spoke through me for about 40 minutes and I typed it up afterwards. And I kept that, that, uh, written, that typed uh, transcript for many years. I haven't got it now, unfortunately. I think it got mislaid. But there was three things that, that stood out in that. Um, one was that um, there would be in the future, now this is 1980, remember, there would be an increase in the use of light and particularly colored light and sound in, in healing. And that has come to pass to a, to a large extent. We're still getting there, but it, they, they now use light and sound, and as you know, ultrasound and infrared light and all kinds of, of light in healing. The second, the second part of this was that um, there would be a coming together of science and spirituality. And that too has, has happened, even though mainstream science still has some trepidation about spirituality and spiritualism and life after death. There are many scientists who are now realizing that consciousness and uh, the spiritual aspect is, is essential to life. <coughs> and science and spirituality has, I've noticed that in my time as a medium, has come more and more together. So, that, that was the second thing. The third thing was that, <coughs> excuse me, that there would be something that would happen uh, that would affect everyone on earth and that we wouldn't be able to escape it. Now, this was a kind of a warning, this part of it. This was a warning. Um, I thought at the time, back in 1980, that it would be perhaps a nuclear, a nuclear bomb, a nuclear attack, something like that. Um, but with hindsight, I think it's more than that. I think it's 5G. I think it's um, these 5G uh, uh, emanations that we're soon gonna, going to be subjected to that will have a, a, a great impact on our health and well-being. And uh, the plan is, of course, to roll out 5G everywhere you know all over the earth and that's being put in place now if you're not aware of that you soon will be so that's what i think he was referring to but i can speak more on that at some point if, if you want me to go down that route so those are the three things that stood out so obviously over the years there has been more emphasis in spiritual circles about things such as quantum physics uh, the quantum nature of reality, the holographic universe, um, and indeed the most important of all, consciousness, as being uh, an essential part of life itself. Now, there was a time when these things weren't so much in the forefront, they weren't talked about, they weren't even known when I set out on my, my journey of, of being a medium. Um, and I know Victor is, is a big supporter, a, a big fan of, of um, Silver Birch, one of the greatest um, spirit guides that, that uh, has ever been, I would suggest. But you, you seldom have ever heard Silver Birch talk about uh, quantum physics or holog holography or, or consciousness in the sense that it's talked about now not because he didn't know about it perhaps or couldn't talk about it but chose not to because the level of understanding at that time in the human race wouldn't have comprehended it i mean i, I remember being at school as, as you you will all do years ago and if somebody had mentioned the internet you would have said well what's that what's the internet what's a mobile phone you'd have no concept of it um, and, and with this in mind, the, the type of information that comes through from spirit guides has changed over the years. 
it's had to change to adapt to the level of understanding and awareness in the human race. Now I know that, you know, we look around us and we see many things that must appall us all, the way that man behaves, you know, the various things that go on, the awful things that we see on the news and the wars and the, the destruction and all the things that go on. And you think, well, actually, perhaps, perhaps mankind has gone backwards. In some ways, perhaps he has, but in other ways, there's an opening up. There's a deepening, a deepening of understanding about scientific and spiritual matters. And this is particularly so in, in, in the realms of quantum physics um, and consciousness. And there, in my experience, is an understanding, an awakening, if you like, that consciousness is essential. It is, it is absolutely intrinsic to life itself and that everything that happens everything that occurs occurs within consciousness even time is, is an aspect of consciousness you know we we hear the terms non-linear and linear time uh, in, in non-linear time there is no there is no time everything happens now there is the the moment we, we call now the, the eternal now um, and these things are opening up man's understanding and spirit and spirit guides such as White Feather are responding to this deepening in man's understanding and, and they're bringing this information through. And I think today's medium, today's trans medium in particular, has to be, and he's a different animal than, than, than he was 30 40 years ago, perhaps even 10 years ago. And it, it brings a greater responsibility for the medium to have some understanding of these subjects himself. Now, you may argue the point, well, if a medium, if a trans medium is bringing through these teachers, such as White Feather and others, surely the information comes from the spirit guide. What does the medium need to understand about it? Well, it doesn't work like that because I think certainly as White Feather says, and I think Silver Birch may have said something similar, uh, give me a tin whistle and I'll play a tune on it, but give me a Stradivarius and I'll play a symphony. The more that the medium knows, the trans medium knows, the more that spirit guides will work with that material. They'll add to it, <coughs> they'll utilize it. I remember many years ago working with Ursula Roberts, who was um, <coughs> the medium for Ramadan, I think. Some of you may know of Ursula Roberts. And she gave a talk at Stansted about markers that spirit guides leave in the medium's auric field. And she said, these are like just little markers of information so that when they come to speak through the medium at a future point they can pick up on these markers it's rather like if you like bookmarks leaving bookmarks where the guy can pick up again and they've marked this information they've even seeded this information into the medium subconscious mind and they will pick up on that and use that information and if the medium themselves has got some level uh, of knowledge, has a reasonable vocabulary, has some uh, understanding of, of these deeper things that we're talking about, then spirit will use that to their advantage. If they know nothing, if the medium knows nothing, it doesn't mean they cannot be used by spirit, but it's that little bit more difficult for them because they have to have a deeper connection uh, to bring through that information. So a true trans medium, in my view, is one that has some knowledge, some understanding of current cutting edge topics that spirit guides will utilize and work on. And remember, it's a blending of minds from spirit, through spirit, to spirit. And spirit will use what we put before them. Spirit will use what we give them. And it's my experience that the teachings that come through now 
from white feather have changed over the years to what they were 20 years ago. There's still the same truth because truth doesn't change. Truth is constant, but knowledge becomes more available. And the more knowledge becomes available, the more spirit will use that to take it even further. And that's why I think the medium of today has to have this grounding, if you like. They have to have this grounding because it makes for a better medium, it makes for a better teacher, a better instrument. And that's really the whole purpose of, I think, you know, good transmediumship. And one of the things I love about White Feather, and um, I can't speak for other spirit guides, although I suspect that Silver Birch and one or two others were, were of the same nature. Um, White Feather likes to challenge people, not in, not in a, an insulting way, of course, always in a loving, kind way, but he will challenge them and stretch their understanding and draw a response from them. And I always feel uh, a good session, a good trans session with a, with a live audience, which I love to do, I can always feel afterwards a kind of a, a buzz in the in the air that something has has, has has been achieved. You know, it's very rare that the the energies go flat. Although occasionally they can do if someone is is being deliberately obstructed, but generally people feed off that energy of knowledge and and, and wisdom and, and and everything that that, that goes with that. And White Feather, of course, feeds off it. He feeds off it himself because he loves to have the debate. He loves to get the message across and the understanding. That's what he is all about. Um, and there's no greater feeling of, of, of that, you know, to, to, to know that you've, you've touched some minds and maybe planted a few seeds. So um, I'm going to take a few questions in a while. Um, I know there's some quite a few people joined us, which is wonderful. Um, so I'm just going to start by taking this question that Giles put earlier. Um, I don't know if you can see it there in the chat. Can everybody see it there in the chat? Um, Giles was asking about um, various kingdoms, gas and mineral, plant and vegetable, animal and human, but also about the kingdom of elves and fairies and sprites and gnomes and hobgoblins and gremlins and leprechauns uh, that's seldom spoken about. Maybe it's not fashionable to speak about these things. You know, I would think if you mention this in, uh, in many quarters, you know, people would uh, probably laugh, you know, sadly, they would probably laugh at it or at least have no no idea what you were talking about thinking it was something to do with folklore um and, and, and i just wanted to say a few things about this because white feather has touched on on this uh, topic a few times very rarely i would say that um but there is what i call the devic kingdom which is um a spirit realm containing um entities uh, that have not come through a human form. They've chosen not to work through a human form as, as we have. Um, and they work through other forms, non-human forms. And their work is to work with the animal kingdom, with the nature kingdom, to, uh, to, to help animals, to help um, life itself on various planets, but we'll, st we'll stick with Earth for now. That is their, their, that is their task. Um, and just as we have helpers and guides, and some would refer to angels, if you like, angelic beings that, that, that uh, look after us and help us, so the animal kingdom too has its own realm of, of spirits uh, that do that work on their behalf. I remember years ago, um, in fact, when I first came into spiritualism, I, I attended a seminar in uh, Hastings. It was the, uh, a healing seminar, and there was a guy there. Some of you may know him, some of you may not. His name was Dennis Fair, F-A-R-E. And he was the, I think, was the leader 
at that time of the Association of uh, Healers. Um, and I remember him saying to me quite distinctly that he had seen uh, what equated to a, a fairy or an angel, an angelic form, um, in, in a particular place in this building and he'd conversed with this form or it, it had spoken to him. Uh, at the time, I, uh, it was beyond me. I didn't quite understand what he was, he was, he was going on about, but I know, I know now what he was talking of. And this was a very, very respected um, healer and medium. Um, some people I've spoken to over the years have seen these forms as well. Um, and you know, Perhaps it's a, it's a certain kind of individual that is privileged to see these uh, devic uh, forms. Um, perhaps some of us are, perhaps we think of ourselves as too advanced or too intellectual or simply we're not spiritually enough uh, aware to, to pick up on them. Um, but they do exist and you've only got to look um, at an animal in your life, a dog or a cat or, or, or a horse or some other animal that you're connected with, to know that they can see things that you can't. They can see things that we can't. Perhaps they're seeing spirit, human spirit beings, or perhaps they're seeing other beings, non-human. Um, but that's my take on it anyway. So I don't know if that answers your question, Giles. Um, by all means, come back to me on that. Yes, he, he, he sort of put his hands together there. So uh, has anybody else got any questions? Because I, I want to make this an interactive uh, talk. I, I love answering questions and, and hearing your take on things. Yeah. During the session, um, I'm not aware of, of any, any physical feelings as such. Uh, I'm not even aware of, of uh, my temperature, my breathing, anything at all. Um, the only thing I'm aware of is, is, is I can hear people's questions because White Feather uses my uh, ears, he uses my voice box, uh, he doesn't use my eyes, my eyes are tight shut, so I can't see anything. I, I sometimes am aware of lights, um, but I'm not aware of myself at all. Uh, it's as though I become him or rather he becomes me, you know, it's, it's hard to, to put it into words, but I, the, the part of me that is, is, is the familiar part that I'm aware of on a daily basis goes somewhere. I don't know where it goes to. When I come back, um, I'm, I'm normally um, very, very tired. Um, and I often, I often joke to the, the organisers of a particular event, event that I have to have chocolate biscuits. It's a, it's a requirement now. I have to have a chocolate biscuit to bring my sugar levels back up. Um, but in all seriousness, you know, yeah, I do feel tired, but I get that back. That sort of comes back to me, you know, as the evening goes on. And uh, I'm usually, um, you know, aware enough and strong enough to be able to drive home where, wherever that might be two, two or three hours sometimes. Um, you know, so they know they have to bring me back to normality. But I do feel tired and sometimes it, that tiredness can last a couple of days. Uh, I think as I've got older, it takes me a little bit longer to, um, to get over, you know, doing these things. But I always, I always get back to normal, thank goodness, whatever normal is. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it depends on the people. Um, we normally do a, about an hour and a half. I think the longest public one I've done is about two hours. Um, but interestingly, um, that hour and a half or that two hours, it goes so quickly. It's to me when I come back, it's like 10 minutes. I, I, have, I have literally no sense of time at all. And the other thing as well, um, I have a different sense of uh, a different spatial sense. Um, when white feathers working through me, I can. I've said to Amanda or Sunflower afterwards. Um, I very often feel as though I'm up in the corner of the room. My consciousness is elevated outside my body, um, and when I when I hear someone ask a question, 
it's as though they're in a different spatial place than they actually are. I've known people, you know, afterwards, and I've looked and I've, they've, they've spoken to me afterwards, and they're sitting in a particular seat, a particular place in the room, and yet when that person has asked a question of white feather, it's as though they're in a different place, or I'm in a different place. It's difficult to say which is which, but there's certainly a, a, a sense of a, a movement there that, that goes on. But time, yet yeah, time is, is irrelevant. It just doesn't exist. Hi, Anne. Hi. Hi, Anne. Hi, hello. Thank you so much. This is very interesting. Um, I'm just beginning to really work on my trance unfoldment, and I've studied at Stansted and, and will be doing so with some other tutors this year. What advice for those of us that are here just starting out with trance? What advice do you have for us in whether it's a meditation or daily practice or um, just really surrendering to to work with your guides how would you uh give some of us newbies advice okay that's, that's a good question Anne, and thank you for asking that there's a few points i'd like to sort of um touch on um one is when you do sit um make it um try and make it in the same place at the same time make that a discipline if you can so if it's if it's a tuesday and a thursday at eight o'clock make it a Tuesday and Thursday at eight o'clock. Try and, try and keep an appointment with, with spirit. They will know then, your helpers will know that they can rely on you to be disciplined enough to be there for them at that time. Now I know time, you know, we talk about time not being as important, but it is in the sense of, of uh, the discipline. Meet them halfway, if you like, and, and, and be disciplined and sit in the same, the same seat, in the same room, in the same energies, whether it's alone or preferably in a group, on the same days each week. Uh, that, that's the important thing. Um, secondly, don't be afraid to ask questions of them. Now, it's important that you trust your guides and your helpers. Um, but don't be afraid to ask them if there's something you don't understand or indeed if there's something you disagree with please ask them i don't know who it was that said test the spirits but i know what they meant by that it's okay to to ask them or say look i don't understand this i don't i, I disagree with this can you explain it and they will give it you in another way that you will understand um, so, so trust is an important element. Um, the other thing I would like to say, or well, two parts to this really, is one is, is about ego or, or lack of ego because um, there's too many egos in the world. Uh, there's too many egos in spiritualism. Uh, so, so if you can be humble, keep your own humility, um, keep your own counsel, you know, don't, don't, don't get talking about it to all and sundry outside of your development. By all means, discuss things with those who are, who are sympathetic, but, but, you know, keep, keep some of that power within yourself um, and, and try and develop uh, um, humility above all else. And also with that and this is very very important i feel and it's it's something that a lot of developing mediums uh, fall into the trap of doing they want to know almost from day one who's my guide who's what what's my guide's name who's put who's who's working with me it's not important names aren't important in the early stages they're not important anyway just just concentrate or, or work with the energy that's working with you get to feel and know that energy and trust that energy and work with it and if that individual or that group want to give you a name or show themselves to you at some point they will do so the reason they may not early on is because <coughs> the human mind has this peculiar um, way of wanting to label things and wanting to know things and putting a label on it. Oh, I've got, I mean, I've had people come up to me after I've done demonstrations, 
did you know you've got Pontius Pilate working with you there? Did you know you've got, you know, King Herod or Judas Iscariot or whoever, whoever you know, they, they think they've seen? And I, I, I'm always polite to them. I say, oh, thank, thank you for, for telling me that. But I'm thinking to myself, myself no, I, this isn't right. And you, you should always keep that in mind that the guide will only give you their name when you're ready, when they know that you're ready to have that name or that description. So work with the teachings, work with the knowledge that they're bringing through, think about what they say, question it, understand it, go deeper into it, and then they will work with you on that. And they'll gradually take you deeper and deeper over time. So those would be the points that I would, would uh, strongly suggest you all try and adhere to if you're developing as a trans I'd yeah. love to know what you've learned about uh, the different spirit realms that spirits go to after they leave the Earth School, specifically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, uh, there are obviously different levels of, of awareness, different frequencies, different realms. Um, White Feather always has a joke with, with members of the audience and uh, with me as well because I've often heard people say well there's seven levels you know there's seven levels going up and there's seven levels going down and White Feather always says well who counted them who counted them and that's his way of saying that uh, infinity is what it says on the label it is what it says on the tin as we develop uh, as consciousness unfolds, in my understanding, greater, uh, greater levels of awareness are, are, are awaiting to be opened up, if you like. And there's no sort of top level where you get to the top of the building and, hey, that's it, I've done it now, I'm perfect. You know, perfection is only reached in eternity. So there's always more levels to, to ascend to as that our understanding and our consciousness unfolds. Um, so all that I understand is that each level is more rarefied, more beautiful. Um, and as we move away from the earth, we go into the astral level, which is the, the, the closest, if you like, to the earth plane. Um, and of course, you know, astral planes can go down as well as up. Uh, but I think the majority of us, uh, in my understanding, go to what would be termed the summer land, which is uh, very similar to the earth, more, more beautiful, but very similar. Um, and that's not, not purgatory, but it's a kind of a place that we can stay for a long time or a short time, depending on, on circumstances and depending on our pathway, before moving further into more rarefied atmospheres. Uh, and and the, the higher we ascend, if you like, the more difficult it is to, to come back directly to the, to the earth plane to communicate. And I know White Feather has said that um, he is an instrument himself for higher minds or higher spirit souls to communicate through in a kind of a waterfall effect. And some of the more rarefied planes in spirit cannot contact there's no direct point of contact with us on earth such as the uh, the gap if you like um, the chasm between us so they, they they come through what are effectively mediums in the afterlife and i think white feather would would, would regard himself as an instrument for higher teachings to come through um, so we can go as low as, as high as we can go as low we can correspondingly go as well. And White Feather has touched briefly sometimes on the lower planes, uh, and he says that it's not a place that any of us would wish to go to. And, and even he would never go down into some of those lower planes on his own, always accompanied by several other people, guides, spirits, if you like. Um, but as to the number of, of, of layers, I don't think there's a fixed number. I think man can, can descend to depths of great darkness, you know, and, and e touching on evil. Equally, he can ascend to planes of great 
joy and love and you know beauty that are indescribable and i think there's a point where perhaps words fail to convey the beauty um i will just touch on something here quickly which which sort of dovetails in with this i don't know if any of you have heard of a, a guy called david hawkins dr david r hawkins um he has written a book about the, um, he's actually charted or, or sort of calibrated the various levels of human emotion and human condition, right from the very lowest, which I think is shame or guilt, up through uh, despair, hopelessness, fear, right up to love, compassion, tolerance, and right up to enlightenment. And it's a wonderful way that he's done this using kinesiology or muscle testing. And it's my guess that those, those calibrations, if you like, are almost a mirror image of the spirit levels that we can ascend to or descend to, depending on our, our, our lack of understanding and knowledge or our, our ability to understand and, and to develop our spiritual gifts and abilities. So it all depends on us, doesn't it, really? You know, it doesn't mean that somebody that's down there in the bottom is any worse th than us. You know, we're all connected. White Feather always says that the spark of the, the spirit can never be extinguished. And even in the lowest of the low, there is the divine spark of the spirit. So we're all one. Let's never forget that. We're all one of, part of one whole. Because Giles had asked um, at some length, White Eagle, who um, is a spirit who spoke through a medium named Grace Cook, and there is a White yeah. Eagle Lodge, I think Grace passed years ago, did yes. extensive writing on the Little Fairy Kingdom. Um, oh, I found right. those yeah. books back in the 70s, and I was very excited because he described the gnomes of the earth and the sylphs of the um, air and the undines were in the water and um, you know, that, that every element and the salamanders in the fire. And to this day, when I, if I'm making a fire or lighting a fire, I always ask the salamanders to alight. So yeah. I was just saying, if people wanted to read a little bit more about all of that, I would look up the work of Grace Cook and White Eagle because they're... Yeah, they're really good. Good. I've forgotten about White Eagle. Yeah, very good. I've read several of White Eagle books over the, over the years. Yeah, good point. And I'll just make a point here, actually. Um, about about uh, not just about nature spirits um, and the Devic kingdom, but also about spirit guides. Uh, just a point, just a general point here. That just just something that's come to mind. We all have respect, I think, for for some of the the great spirit guides, the great teachers, and the, and the knowledge that they have and they bring through. Um, but we must always remember that what what they are capable of we are capable of ourselves we are capable of ourselves and it's not a question of, of it, there's no race it's not a question of one being better or greater than another but you know i've often heard people say and, and you might laugh at this but i've heard mediums say well i never go anywhere without asking my guide you know if it's okay to go there or my guide always helps me find the right uh, popcorn in the, in the supermarket I, my guide always <laughs> helps me find a parking space and i'm thinking hold on a minute here come on you know for one thing spirit guides have got better things to do than to find you a parking space but what's this saying about about yourself about themselves you know we we, we are all one on this pathway we're all have infinite capacity within us and what any white feather or silver birch can, can, can speak of or, or have access to, so can we, and we will do at some point. So, so let's just, just keep that in mind whilst being humble, um, you know, not getting ahead of ourselves, but let's just remind ourselves of the awesome potential that we've each got within ourselves. Thanks, Robert. Does White Feather talk at all about angels or about reincarnation? Very often speaks about reincarnation. Uh, doesn't speak very often about angels. Um, I mean, I think of angels as being um, 
Yeah, well, similar to what we've spoken of about the Divic Kingdom, and I think angels are another label that people use. I think people hang their hats on, on angels quite a lot, you know, and they say, well, you know, you've got the Archangel Gabriel or the Archangel so-and-so and so-and-so, and, you know, it's almost as though they put every emphasis on that. that, that that's up to them if they want to do that. Uh, White Feather, again, he, he can, whilst being respectful, he very often has a little joke about angels because he's, and I hope this doesn't offend anybody because that's not the purpose of it, but he often says, I bet they have trouble putting their pullover on with those wings on their back. Uh, you know, and, and I think, he, you know, people think of angels and they take, take it literally, you know. Um, so, but, but that's just, that's just his way of, of, of talking. He said, he said to me many times, I've never seen an angel. I've never, but there are many angels on earth and many in heaven. And I think what he means by that is the person themselves is angelic in their, in their compassion, in their love, in their ability to help anyone. You know, you, you, we all know of angels that walk on this earth, and there's, you know, there's been quite a number of those who, who do good upon the earth. And I think we all, if we're honest, we try and do our best. We try and be an angel ourselves if, if we can and help others. Regarding um, reincarnation, he's always spoken about that. Since day one, he's spoken about it. He said it, it's not compulsory. He says no one sort of stands over you with a big, big stick saying you've got to go back on earth. There's no compulsion, there's no law that demands that you come back through another, another body on earth. But he always quantifies, qualifies that by saying that there will come a point in your awareness in spirit after, after, in the afterlife that perhaps there's certain things that need to be addressed you know, whether you're talking about karma um, or, or certain issues, uh, relationship issues or things that you, you might have done better or things that you've left undone and you realise that you can't quite move on in the spirit world until those have, have been put right. And that's where he speaks of re reincarnation being a fact, although it's not a fact for everyone, but he does say that it exists. I, I think uh, that the reincarnation is, is wonderful because I think if you spend a couple of hundred years in the afterlife, you go and see all the movies and plays that you wanted to see. You see them all again, and then you see them all again, and then you go to all the parties you want to go to. Then you do yeah. all the social work that you know you have to do. You're a low-level guide, a higher-level guide, whatever you're capable of. And at a certain point, you say to yourself, oh... I'm bored. I've done all this. I have to go back. And all your friends say, no, 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 <laughs> get, back, get away from me. And then, of course, in the end, you say, well, I can't really advance here. This is what I've been given to understand on this. I cannot really increase the size of my spirit in the afterlife because it's all too easy. There are no pressures. Mm. And so, therefore, you get to converse, conversating, as they say here in North Carolina, you get to conversating with your uh, guides and your uh, mentors and your betters and your equals, and then you decide what kind of a reincarnation would do you the most good, what you can handle without committing suicide. Because if yeah. you pick something that's too much for you, that's no good. It's got to be something you can handle. Yeah. And so then in the end, you, you do indeed, just as you said, you make your own decision to go back because you want to. You must. Yeah. I think there's one thing that we've got to mention here, Giles, which um, we haven't really touched on yet, and that is your level of free will. Um, and I think that as you develop spiritually, you, your level of free will uh, increases, it widens. Uh, I think if, you, if you're, for want of a better word, if, you, if you're of a low spiritual vibration, I think you're your choices are somewhat more limited than they would be if you're more evolved. I think as you evolve spiritually, your free will increases. White Feather often refers to life as being like on a, on a freeway or, or a motorway or a highway where the general direction uh, has been uh, set by your free will, but you're still driving the car. You can wander from 
one lane to another, but your general parameters, i.e. the extremities of the road or the highway, are set before you come upon the earth by your free will. So in other words, you still have the ability to turn the car around, go the other way, go backwards, crash the car, go off the road, go off, but you've still got to follow that general pathway that your free will has created. And I don't think we can, we can ever quite totally exclude uh, our personal free will. I don't know what you think of that. Um, if I may, I would like to agree 100% because uh, clearly we have 20,000 incarnations or more and if we let us say let us imagine that we are coming around for the first 500 incarnations well i don't think we've got much of a brain there we're just full of desires and so there's no yeah. question that that uh, a reincarnation you would take the first thing you can get um a war of uh, ethiopia during a famine anything will do and yeah. then when you come to the middle uh, after you've had many, many incarnations, then you start to say, hold on a minute, I've done that. Mm. Um, I've done all that. I, I, let me be a little more picky. And then, of course, as you fill in some more, that I'm just picking an arbitrary number of 20,000. Yeah. Uh, let's say you're around 15 or 18,000. Now you're going to get very picky about what your yeah. reincarnations are. So there I would completely agree with you and say it's a question of development. Yeah. I think so. And can I just, uh, um, I, I, I think we're on the same wavelength, uh, Giles, with that. Can I just bring in just another point quickly, which I want to open up to everyone uh, who's listening to this regarding reincarnation, because one of the fears that uh, people seem to have is that supposing a, 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 a family member has passed on, uh, which family members, older family members tend to do, such as grandparents and parents, they pass before their siblings. One of the concerns of the sibling is that when they pass on themselves, their parents or grandparents have reincarnated. So they're sort of going to miss each other like ships in the night. And one thing that Whitefeather just, just say, which is quite comforting, I feel, is that there are certain laws, if you like, or parameters in place generally, although there are some few exceptions, where one will not reincarnate until a certain, if you like, family um, generations have completed their own lifetimes on the earth. So you're not, going to, you're not going to pass over and find that your mother or father has come back in another body until you've, you know, until everything's completed, if you like, until the cycles, the family cycles, uh, have completed, then reincarnation tends not to occur. Uh, obviously, when the sort of when you get to five, six, seven generations, the younger generation never knew the great, 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 great grandparents anyway. They didn't know them on the earth. Put it that way. They might know them spiritually, but they didn't know them on the earth, and so it wouldn't matter to an extent. If, if those first generations had reincarnated. Uh, I know there's exceptions to this in some cultures um, where, you know, there's been instances of a child being reincarnated and he, he remembers where he lived before or she lived before and has taken her parents to the house where she used to live. And you think, well, how can this be? That's only one generation. So it, it clearly can happen. Uh, where you get a quick turnaround, if you like, but I think that uh, tends to be in the minority rather than, than uh, commonplace. But it's worth just mentioning on that because a lot of people do worry about that point. Hi. Um, Say hi. Hi. How are you doing, Robert? Thanks very much. This is all terrific. Um, look, I've got a very basic question and it's just one I'm, I've been watching with interest trance over uh, many years now and... and um, uh, well, not of large sections, I haven't, but I notice that sometimes trans, in a trans mediumship, the person is embodied with a spirit and the voice changes and the physicality changes and there's an absolute presence. But I'm seeing increasingly that there's um, channeling and th th those sort of affectations do not seem to be, and uh, th that sort of presence does not seem to be 
as vivid. So um, I just wondered if this is an evolutionary thing or, um, yeah, if you've got any comments about that. I don't think it's an evolutionary thing, no. I think, I think as, as I want to distinguish between channeling and transmediumship. I think channeling has become quite popular um, and almost, you know, touching on mainstream, really. Um, and I know a lot of, I've seen some, I won't mention any, any names, but I've seen certain channelers that are quite popular. And I'm watching these people and I'm thinking, hmm, I'm not sure that's trance, you know, how much of that is their own subconscious mind? Um, I mean, one of the things White Feather always emphasise, well, we talk about it ourselves before we do the trance demonstration as well, is um, that you must always um, you must always discern when you're watching a trance demonstration whether it is genuine or whether that person is fooling themselves, whether it's uh, you know a kind of an illusionary thing where they're, they're fooling themselves. And one of the tests that White Feather always suggests that you you use on this. Um, is that whenever you ask a question of an entranced medium or supposedly entranced medium, the answer should come back immediately. There shouldn't be any floweringness, you know, there shouldn't be any, any, any hesitation, there shouldn't be any need to use flowery language, there shouldn't be any, any, any hesitation at all. The answer should be there straight away. Um, and if it isn't, if the, if, the, if the guide says, hang on a minute, I've got to go away and find the answer to this, then that isn't trance, you know. Um, also, the, the language that the guide uses should be eloquent. It should be superior to that of the medium themselves. Um, and it should be respectable. Uh, it should be respect. Uh, it should respect the, the level of audience that are there. It shouldn't go over their head. It shouldn't demean them. I mean, I, I've, seen, I've seen supposed trance through a physical mediumship where the guide has come, supposedly a, 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 red in, a red man has come through and, and used swear words, has used the F word and, and used swear words. And I'm thinking, no, why would any guide you know, advanced soul use language like that. There's no need for that at all. The same as any any medium that uh, pulls faces, that uses pidgin English, uh, that postures, that, that does all these mannerisms. No, forget it. It's got to be trans mediumship is a, is a control of mind to mind, soul to soul, spirit to spirit. And, and it, it has to be viewed for what it is. The, the guide should be able to demonstrate an eloquence, a wisdom, a love, a compassion, an understanding that surpasses anything else that the medium themselves could, could bring. And if you see that, if that's in evidence, <coughs> and if the quality of the communication is good, and the answers are good and knowledgeable, then, you know, it's pretty well certain that it's, it's trans control. If it isn't, personally, I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't stay too long. You know, I'd be going out the door at the right opportune moment. Thank you. That's just me, but. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. I've seen, a lot of, I've seen a lot of trans that isn't trans, put it that way. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Sherry, you had a question? Um, yes, I, I was going to add that through the um, messages have come through a number of times when parents who were younger parents, younger sets of parents had lost a baby. We did have parents questioning whether this child would come back, could come back. And in many cases, and some we've already seen, Ari Stroop was on with her little baby girl, but where we were told, yes, you know, I can in fact come back. So maybe also, again, it's that kind of thing where the really significant love relationship could still be honored yeah. and so that might be a case also where they would come back right away to, yeah. to complete that relationship that ended with the child being so young yeah but, I, I do believe 
I, I do believe there's exceptions to every every rule, and quite clearly that does, as you say, that does happen sometimes. You know, you know it, it seems to me as if love rules, and so again, like if you know, once you get to that fifth generation where the great 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 grandchildren don't know who Nana and Papa were anymore, yeah. and that those people feel free to come back and reincarnate, yeah. but it's as if it's the love I kind of see. Like you know, if there's a strong love relationship, spirit will you know, will not come back yet be, until they can give you that greeting again that you want so badly. Yeah. Well, there's two things here I, I, I'd say. One, one of the great um, sayings that White Feather often repeats is that where there is love, there is no separation. And that's always stuck in my heart and my mind. That's, that's so true. The other thing is, uh, in the case of a young child, a baby that's died and that comes back again to that couple, perhaps, I don't know, let's say, let's say they, hypothetical situation, they have a miscarriage. Right. And, and the, 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 the baby that's miscarried, of course, continues in the spirit world. That soul continues to live. The couple desperately want another child. They conceive again and the second child is an aspect of the first child. Exactly. Maybe a facet of the diamond, maybe an aspect of the first child that comes, reincarnates into a new body. So it all works out as it was intended to. But when they pass, of course, they've still got the first aspect of that child that was miscarried in the spirit world awaiting them. So in actual fact, they have two children, but it's an aspect of the same, yes. you know. It's just a thought, so... Well, it's very interesting because uh, right before the woman who had come to me asking for a reading, a medium had told her that the little boy she lost wanted to come back and she wanted to know if I'd confirm it. And in the EVP reading, he did say, I mean, the, one of the messages was, I will come back. Um, yeah. Shortly before she was due to give birth, she asked for another reading and I was using a different line where I'm able to, it's my electronic assisted clairaudient line where I can hear it although others don't, and, but, I, but it, there's a lot more information that comes through. And this, this little girl who was coming through said, Mom, I don't want to be the little girl who grows up in her brother's shadow. I will mm. have aspects of Bodhi with me, but I will be me. And I think that's pretty much what you were saying, and it's so fascinating, yeah. but I never thought yeah. that the original Bodhi, you know, that that aspect would still be there to greet them. So it's like a double gift. Yeah, double gift, yeah. I think, Robert, I think um, in trying to do the trance, one of the key things which you just addressed is the relationship between the subconscious mind and, and the trance work, that yeah. sometimes it's really difficult to um, distinguish between the two. I found it very interesting that you said that today's medium needs to be very knowledgeable because that's always been one of the issues with me is that um, because I am an academic and very well read that people were thinking that it was my subconscious that would come through in the trans mediumship rather than the, mm. than the spirit. So that has always been kind of like people have said to me, it's, that's a negative that I shouldn't be so, um, academic. Yeah, I mean, there's always there's always a danger that people will think that, and they will associate your, uh, you know, your, your intellect and your academic uh, development with with what's coming through as though it's your own mind. You you know, you're bringing it from your own mind. Listen, you you know, you've you've obviously learned to deal with that. You know, I would say to anyone, don't worry about that too much. What other people think, as long as you're um, honest in yourself, you know and you keep your integrity, uh, don't, don't worry about it, just let it come through. Because I think, as I said in the opening talk, spirit will work with whatever substance you give them. I mean, one of the little, th little known facts is that um, when a guide works through a trans medium, the, the subconscious mind of that trans, trans, me trans medium is almost like a prison to the guide in that they have certain restrictions on what they can do in terms of uh, they will draw upon the language that you, you normally use, uh, unless it's a specialised kind of mediumship. They will, they will draw on the words that you use. I know they sometimes bring the occasional word or phrase that you've never heard of, but generally 
they will speak your language uh, and that is their confinement if you like that is their their for want of a better word their their constraints um and obviously they will push the boundaries of that but if, you, if you're offering them a greater vocabulary, a greater understanding, a greater knowledge than someone that knows absolutely nothing, then they can work and they will work with it. They will utilize you as an instrument because what people don't realize is that mediumship is very much, very, very much a two way thing. It's a meeting of, of souls and, and the two, like two rivers come together and where you have this, this basic, uh, knowledge and understanding and, and intellect, they will use it to, to their advantage. Um, so I wouldn't worry about what other people think. It's, a, it's unfortunate that people do make that connection. They put two and two together and come up with five and inevitably it's, it's, it's wrong, isn't it? Well, yeah. What, yeah um, what I also found very helpful was your comment that when you're in trance, the answer has to come immediately. There can't yeah. be a pause. So yeah. that's what I will look for now. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, you know yourself, sometimes if someone asks you a question, you have to just think for a moment, mm -hmm. you know, about the answer. But I found very often when, when someone's asked White Feather a question, the answer is already forming in the mind before the question's been asked, or it's only half been asked, and the answer's already there. That's how quick it is, it's instantaneous. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, now, you did mention something about wanting to get back to talk about 5G. I wonder if you could do that. Yeah, I'll just say a few words about that because obviously, uh, well, not obviously, but it is being, it will be sold to humanity as, uh, as the greatest thing since sliced bread. Uh, and it will, uh, you know, enable people to download movies and things instantaneously and, and have all these wonderful connections. It's actually part of what's known as the smart grid or the Internet of Things. It's going to connect everything to everything else. Um, in, in, the, in the first instance, it'll be mobile phone use. <coughs> but then you'll find that you have uh, more and more intrusion into your lives purely and simply because they want to get uh, a, a find a way of connecting the human race in a kind of artificial intelligence way to a um, to a supercomputer or computers that will feed you your thoughts and your information and control every every aspect of your lives now i know this is going into the realms of big brother and conspiracy but uh, as I say, we have been warned about this, Spirit know about this, and they've warned us about this over the years, and now it's coming to pass. Uh, the thing is, I mean, was any, were any of us asked if we wanted 5G, you know, transmitters that are, are pumping microwave radiation into our bodies uh, everywhere we go? You know, you won't be able to escape this anywhere in any country or any part of the earth. Um, and that, that will bring increasing number of cancers and, and shorten lifespan enormously. And all this is untested, by the way, untested technology. We're, we're, we're taking part in a, in a massive uh, test, if you like, a, a trial, if you like, to, to see this, uh, this 5G uh, network come into being. And uh, when, when they're challenged by this, the, the, the phone companies, they will always say, well, we've done testing and it's perfectly safe and it's within safe limits. And, you know, how many times have we heard that going back to thalidomide and, you know, um, you know, crop spraying, you know, from Monsanto and, and other companies like that, additives in food, fluoride in the water, you know, the list is endless. We've fed these things by people who say it's good for us, and yet it turns out to be totally the opposite. And it's all part, I don't know whether you feel this, people who are listening to me now, if you're honest with yourself, do you feel that the world is going in the right direction? Do you feel it's a happy place? Do you feel that you feel comfortable with what's going on? I'm not just talking about politics, but the world in general. Something inside me, 
uh, I don't I don't trust myself as being anything special, but I, something inside of me is shouting, is screaming to me, this isn't right. You know, the world's not right. Medicine isn't right. Politics isn't right. You know, all this about climate change. And I could go on about it. And 5G, you know, is, is, is part of this network of, of things that that's, were being attacked on all levels. And I'm a big sort of... Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm not frightened to speak out against it, you know, and I think if it, it only takes a few good men to say nothing for evil to triumph. And unless we, we speak out, particularly those of us who are privileged, if you like, to be on this edge of awareness of, of the afterlife and, and things beyond this material world, I think we have a responsibility. You know, spiritual development brings its own responsibility and we have to exercise that, I think, if not for our children or our grandchildren, for all of us uh, who come on this earth, we have to speak out. Um, I try and do it in a way, you know, I don't go on rallies and marches and things like that, although I, I think those people that do that are wonderful. Uh, I like to do it in other ways. Uh, and I know from, from White Feathers Communication, and this sort of brings forth circle to what I said in my opening talk in the way that spirit communication has changed over time to meet the needs of the modern age. And uh, cometh the hour, cometh the man. The information will come through in response to what is needed for that time and that generation. And White Feather has spoken out many times about this. Often he's attacked for it uh, in live, live talks we've given. People have stood up and walked out or said something, you know, and uh, he just takes it all in his stride and his answer is, well, I'm not changing the truth for you. So I, I, I'm happy to put that out there and, uh, you know, it's up for each of you to, to take it on board or, or disregard it. You've got free will, the choice is yours. But the information is there. And if you look into it, don't take my word for it. Do your own research and uh, you'll find the answers are out there. Thank you, Robert. And I know you have a lot of wonderful videos uh, that people can have a look at on YouTube. Uh, how often do you put videos out? Not as often as I, I'd like to. Um, I haven't done any for a while. Um, sometimes when we do trans demonstrations, uh, particularly one or two different centres in the UK, they tend to film them. Uh, I know when we go to Northampton, they, they always video them. And the guy there, he says, um, I'll go away and I'll, I'll edit these and send them across to you in small videos. And he's been very kind. He's done that free of charge. And I post them on the internet. Um, and occasionally we do, you know, a live trance demonstration uh, over the internet. And, and, and they, they are put up as well. So it's one of, one of the good things about technology is that you can get to more people on a global, as you find yourself with your wonderful, uh, you know, talks and, and things that you do like tonight, you know, you can get to a lot of people and that's a good thing, I think. So uh, I always say to people, keep an eye on the website, uh, in, you know, and, and look out for, for new things and, and whenever we can post a new video, we'll do that. Uh, the website, for those who don't know, is whitefeather.org.uk. And all the White Feather books and a couple of my own books um, are on Amazon. Uh, I know we, we sell a few books in Australia, certainly in the USA and, and, and different places, um, but they're all there on, on, on Amazon. So, uh, again, that's a good way of, of getting information out to people. <laughs> I just um, really appreciate, Robert, your, um, your talk this afternoon, your respectful answering of all the questions your incredible knowledge and the history of uh, working with White Feather for 45 years is just amazing to me. Uh, and I think of all of us, that we so appreciate your time uh, and all of the knowledge that you have so willingly volunteered to impart to all of us. Thank you so, so much for being here and being with us today. Thank you very much. It's very kind. I appreciate your words and I, I thank all of you who have uh, joined in on this conversation and all of you who will watch the video uh, in, in the coming months and weeks ahead. So uh, thank you all. It's been a pleasure to talk with you and 
Let's do it again sometime. That'd be nice. We'd love to have you back again, Rob. And anytime, okay. anytime that works for you.